Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This will be part 3 of The Volpine Huntsman of Vale. All credit to the author, their information can be found in the description below, as well as a link to the story if you would like to read along. This will be chapter 7 to 9. Also, don't forget to smash that like button and comment to help with the algorithm. It's much appreciated. Now let's get into the story. The next morning, Naruto was up and ready before the rest of his team. He began to sort through his standard ninja equipment, making sure that his thigh pouch had five kanai, each made of meteorite metal, standard steel, explosive tagged, and attached to ninja wire. He also restocked his smoke pellet supply from his bag and put tin steel shuriken into it as well. He included a pack of tin loose explosive tags as well. As he did this, he glanced at the Borbatusk tusks that he had mounted on the wall above his bed, smiling as he remembered Professor Port's expression when he cut them off the grim. By the time he had finished, the rest of his team was up and had almost finished getting ready. Yang was drying her hair after her shower, which took a considerable amount of time. Ruby had just finished cleaning up from her late study session, and Blake was reading a book, as usual. Naruto decided that now was as good a time as any to enact the idea he had been thinking about since yesterday. He walked up to Ruby and said, quietly enough, so that only Ruby could hear him over Yang's hairdryer, Hey, Ruby, I found out something yesterday that I think you should know about. Ruby looked at him with curiosity. What is it? I found out that we will be assigned ranks later this week that will determine what type of missions we can take from our professors. Apparently, we will get ranks both as individuals and as a team overall. It might be a good idea to be prepared for whatever tests the professors are going to put us through. Ruby's eyes widened. Okay, what should we do to prepare? Naruto smiled with amusement. That's your call. I'm just delivering information and a recommendation, as is my duty. It's up to you as the team leader to make a decision based on it. As he walked over to his desk, he heard Kurama say, We will see if this ninjin is able to handle the position given to her. Naruto put a notebook and a few pencils in his bag and replied, I have absolute faith in her. I meant what I said about her having what it takes to be a great leader. He spared a glance over to Ruby to see that she was deep in thought. After Yang had finished drying her hair and Naruto had packed his bag for the day, Ruby made a decision. All right, time for a team meeting, Team Ruby. Blake put her book down and Yang and Naruto turned to face Ruby. A team meeting? Since when do we have those? Yang asked it. Ruby crossed her arms and said, Since right now. We have some important business that needs taken care of. Naruto told me that later this week, we are going to get ranks, and we should all be prepared so we can rank as high as possible. So, I am calling a team practice session later today. We do have some classes, so how about we all meet back here at 4 o'clock? Young Surugit. Sounds fine to me. Blake nodded her approval, and Naruto smiled. Proud of Ruby for using her authority properly. I will look forward to it. However, I have a class for now, so I will see you all at 4. He left the room with his bag, and the three girls went back to their usual business. Ruby also had class soon and began to gather her supplies. After she was finished gathering everything, she looked at Blake for a moment, who had gone back to reading her book. She walked up to Blake and said, Hey, Blake, you know that other language that Naruto knows, right? Blake looked up from her book. You mean Japanese? I know enough to get by. I'm not completely fluent though. Why do you ask? Ruby looked like she wasn't sure if she wanted to ask Blake her question. Well, Naruto said something yesterday, and I just wanted to know what it meant. What is Taicho? Blake looked surprised. Did Naruto call you Taicho? Ruby nodded, feeling nervous. Is that a bad thing? What does it mean? With a smile, Blake put her book down. It means he really respects you. Taicho means captain. It's what a soldier would call his or her commanding officer to show respect. A massive smile spread across Ruby's face. Naruto was a powerful huntsman, and given the fiasco with the Bio Wolves during initiation, his respect meant a great deal to her. As she went to class and the hours passed, the smile never completely faded from her face. She did her best to pay attention, but she couldn't help thinking about the previous night and how Naruto got coffee for her and called her captain. He was the first person to refer to her by her title like that, and that made it feel even more special to her. After lunch, Ruby went to her unarmed combat class, which she had with Yang. She sat next to her sister, and as the professor began the short lecture before the imminent spars, she was still caught up in her thoughts with a slight smile. She blushed slightly as she remembered how Naruto had quelled her protests to his offer of coffee. Unfortunately for Ruby, Yang had been observing her, having already noticed that she seemed distracted. Yang noticed the blush and smiled mischievously. So, Ruby, what's on your mind? Thinking about someone. 
are we? Ruby looked back at Yang as her eyes widened. What? No, of course not. Why would I be thinking about anyone? She quickly looked away, and her blush deepened slightly in embarrassment for being caught, and Yang's smile got wider. Oh, you are so thinking about someone. So, who is it that my dearest little sister has a crush on? Ruby nearly fell out of her chair in shock. Nobody. I don't have a crush. At that moment, the professor told the class to divide into pairs to practice some basic unarmed combat, and Yang put an arm around Ruby's shoulders before she could bolt, leading her to one of the rings just outside the classroom. Whether you admit it or not, sis, you got a crush. Daydreaming? Blushing? Denying it? All signs of infatuation. So, who is it? But it's not. I don't. He's not. Ruby tried to form a coherent rebuttal and failed as Young faced off with her and took a stance. She barely even noticed her sister throwing her out of the ring once the professor gave the call to begin. Is it true? Do I really have a crush on Naruto? Back at Team Ruby's room, Naruto had just returned from his second class of the day, which was botany, his notebook full of notes on edible and poisonous plants. Blake was in the room as well, having returned from lunch just a few minutes before. It was 3.35, and Ruby and Yang would probably be returning soon. Iblaka, Naruto grata. Blake smiled back at him. Hello, Naruto. Enjoy your class? Naruto shrugged. I guess. I learned not to eat nightshade, so that's good at least. Yes, I suppose that is a good thing, Blake said before going back to reading. Naruto put his notebooks on his desk, which he had switched with the bookshelf that had rested between the two sets of bunk beds the day that they had redecorated the room. It was actually a very efficient rearrangement, as the movable bookshelf was now underneath one of the sets of wall-mounted bookshelves, while his desk made an excellent step up that allowed Ruby and Yang to get up to their bunk beds more easily. The extra light from the window would also be nice for when he needed to work on delicate fuinjutsu constructs. Once he had finished organizing his things, he turned back toward Blake, who didn't notice him looking at her as she read her book. He hesitated for a moment before saying, Hey, Blake? Blake looked up from her book again and said, Yeah? I was just wondering, why did you decide to learn Japanese? Well, Blake said as she closed her book and set it on the bed next to her. When I was younger, I was always fascinated with some of the old legends that were passed down in my family. If Naruto noticed her slight hesitation, he didn't show it. I kind of developed a passion for these legends and myths of strange creatures and warriors who could cut lightning in half with their weapons, so I was always trying to find new stories to read. Something seemed familiar about a warrior who could cut lightning, but Naruto couldn't place where he might have heard that before as Blake continued. The thing was, a lot of the oldest and best stories were originally written in Japanese. Some of them were never translated properly. I wanted to be able to read those stories too, so I got a friend to teach me Japanese. It took nearly a year before I got the hang of it, but it was worth it. I've kept in practice as much as possible, although it's hard to come by good copies of stories in Japanese. They're usually pretty expensive. That's as good a reason as any, Naruto said. I can relate to that passion for legends. Some old legends were a big part of what motivated me to want to become a warrior. Blake looked interested. Really? Any legends in particular? Naruto smirked. The tales of the previous Hokage's feats were pretty legendary after all. There was a great warrior from my home who had a very powerful coup, um, semblance. He caught himself before he could say Kekiai Jenkai on accident. He could control trees and wood and could use his own energy to help them grow. The legend says that one day, he came upon a wasteland that had once been a beautiful place. Battles and war had torn it apart and it saddened him. So he reached out with his power and gave the command, Jukai Koten, Deep Forest Emergence. From the wasteland, saplings sprouted and began to grow. For three days and three nights, he stood upon a clifftop overlooking the wastelands before him, and he slowly transformed it into a lush forest. After he had exhausted himself, he looked down at the forest he had created and smiled. A village was built at the base of that cliffside, and the people put the forest's creator's likeness on the face of it so that they would always remember who had given them their beautiful home. Wow. Blake looked surprised. I've never heard of that one before, but why would that inspire you to become a warrior? Sure, it was a great feat to accomplish with Aura, but it doesn't really scream huntsman. With a smile, Naruto said, the man was a great warrior, remember? That story gives me. I don't know if you'd call it hope, or peace of mind even. It just makes me think that destroying things doesn't have to be my entire existence. Even if I'm a warrior who can cause so much destruction, I can create things too. I can promote life and help people in ways other than killing things.
Blake was at a loss for words for a moment. That's really profound, actually. At that moment, the door to the dorm room opened, and Yang and Ruby walked in. Ruby's cheeks were a little red, and Yang looked smug about something. It was obvious that Yang had been teasing her younger sister about something, and by the looks of it, was very successful. Ruby ignored Yang as best she could and grabbed her battle skirt and the rest of her outfit, dropping off her school things as she did so. She quickly went into the bathroom to change, shutting the door behind her. Blake, who was already in her usual outfit, looked at Yang with curiosity in her gaze. What's got her upset? Yang began to change into her fighting outfit in front of her two teammates, not caring if they got an eyeful. Oh, she's just mad that I figured out that she's got a crush on someone. I couldn't get her to tell me who it was, though. So, Taicho has a love interest now? Naruto asked. That could be interesting. He had looked away from Yang while she was changing and turned back to see that his fellow blonde was fully clothed again. By the time Ruby had come out of the bathroom, now in her black and red skirt and hood, Blake had regained her composure, and Naruto walked into the bathroom with his own clothes. Yang tilted her head as the door shut behind him. I wonder why he changes in the bathroom all the time. He doesn't seem like he'd be the shy type. Ruby shrugged and blushed, imagining Naruto changing with her in the room. Blake looked at Yang and said, he might just be shy about his body. You can be outgoing and still a little modest as well. Yang threw git. Maybe. At that point, Naruto returned, dressed in a black t-shirt with an orange Uzumaki spiral on it and black shorts with an orange stripe down the sides. His right thigh had bandages wrapped tightly around it, with his thigh pouch secured properly. Alrighty then, he said. Let's get going. After they had retrieved their primary weapons from their lockers, they all headed to the training arena, which consisted of an area of grassy, slightly uneven ground surrounded by a large ellipse painted on the ground to provide a boundary marking. Ruby gathered everyone around and said, Okay, now that we're all here, let's start with, um... She glanced over at Naruto, as if hoping he would have an answer. What exactly should we do? Karama snorted. Is she the leader of this team, or are you? Naruto shushed Karama mentally. She's new at this and she hasn't had the advantage of having a 10,000-year-old demon lord in her head to teach her. Karama was appeased by the implied thanks, and Naruto focused his attention back on his teammates. Let's form up into teams of two and spar with each other for a while, switching partners every few minutes. That way, we can begin getting used to working in smaller units within our squad should the need arise. This will also get us more accustomed to each other's fighting styles both as a comrade and as an enemy. When you know your teammates well enough, you can perform combos and plans with very little preparation or communication. First up, let's do Yang and me versus Blake and Ruby. Throughout Naruto's short speech, the three other members of the team had different reactions. Ruby looked at the ground, slightly embarrassed that she had no idea what to do and had made Naruto step in to pick up the slack, but also grateful to him for his help. Yang smiled at the chance to fight with everyone on the team and to show off a bit. Blake narrowed her eyes slightly. Naruto sounded like an experienced soldier who had worked in a small squad often, but where would he have gotten that type of experience? Naruto and Yang began moving to the north end of the arena, while Blake and Ruby went to the south end. They had all applied shielding dust to their weapons, making it so that they couldn't do too much damage, and had loaded their firearms with very weak rounds for the same purpose. You ready, Whiskers? Naruto's eye twitched at Yang's nickname for him. Always. Warn me if you're going to get closer than a few feet to me, though. I am known to coat myself in fire occasionally. Yang looked at him with a massive smile. That won't be a problem. I'm known to do the same. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Really? Awesome. Yang nodded. Yup. From this day forward, we will be known as Team Hot Stuff. Kurama laughed, and Naruto facebombed as both teams reached their respective places. Naruto readied himself and called out, Okay, go. All four of them immediately began to rush forward. Yang fired a few shots from Ember Celica as she went, while Ruby did the same with Crescent Rose. Blake and Naruto drew their blades, and both teams started dodging the other's shots as they ran. Blake was clipped by one of Yang's fireballs on her leg as she approached, and Naruto took a direct hit to the stomach with one of Ruby's dust rounds, slowing him for a moment so that Yang clashed with Blake and Ruby before he got there. Naruto formed a cloak of golden flames around him as he came up behind Yang, who was forced to play defense by the two-on-one assault and had taken a few minor hits because of it. He jumped over Yang, landing between Ruby and Blake, and forcing them to scatter after scoring a few hot strikes to both of them. Team Hot Stuff went back to back as Ruby and Blake moved in to renew their assault. Blake came after Naruto while Yang was forced to deal with Ruby's incredibly powerful scythe attacks. Using Firestorm, 
Naruto proceeded to block several swings from Blake's katana before flaring his fire out toward her, forcing her to jump back and give him room to swing Firestorm at her. She blocked the strikes he tried to land before using her semblance to flash back away from him and shift Gamble shroud into pistol form. Throughout this time, Naruto heard Ruby firing Crescent Rose in the background, using recoil to put more force into her swings. Naruto called out, Young, roll left now, before sheathing his sword and rolling to his right as Blake fired her pistol. They heard Ruby cry out as the shot hit her, as Young had rolled with Naruto out of the way. Naruto glanced at Young, who looked slightly battered. It's a bad idea to try and block Ruby's attacks, Young said as the two teams had a mini stare down. We can't try to go back to back and stand our ground again. Naruto nodded. Then let's go on the attack this time. Young smiled, and they both charged, Naruto heading for Ruby this time as Young began to fire at Blake. Ruby fired a few shots at Naruto as he approached, but he was able to dodge all of them this time around. As he approached, he wove a few hand seals and shouted, Futon, de tapa. Great breakthrough. Ruby was blown backward by a large gust of wind from Naruto's palms and sunk Crescent Rose's blade into the ground to anchor herself. Naruto used this opening to land a kick to her shoulder, knocking her a few yards toward Blake, who was engaged in a furious bout of close quarters combat with Yang. Blake's blades blurred as they swung at Yang and blocked the blonde's dust-powered punches. When Ruby landed, Blake jumped back to her to defend her while she recovered. As Ruby got up, Yang began to fire her dust rounds at Blake, who deflected them to defend Ruby. Naruto wove an Inu seal followed by a Hitsuji seal. He clapped his hands together and shouted, Futon, Rapusho, Gale Palm. A smaller but more concentrated gust of wind flew at Blake and collided with one of the dust rounds Yang was firing, causing a large explosion that threw both Blake and Ruby backward. Naruto's eyes widened in shock as he shouted, Stop, Spa-oa. He ran over to Blake and Ruby, who were slowly standing up, followed closely by Yang. Yang immediately hauled her sister to her feet and checked to see if she was okay, while Naruto helped Blake regain her feet and asked, are you okay? Are you burned at all? Blake smiled and said, I'm fine. I have a few minor burns, but I'll be fine to fight if we can rest a little. I think I caught most of the explosion, so Ruby should be fine as well. As she spoke, her aura began to slowly heal the few burns she had sustained, and she sat down to rest. Naruto nodded, relieved, as Ruby and Yang walked over to them. Ruby asked, Why did your shot explode, Yang? I thought you were using practice shells. Yang lo oket horrifiet. I, I was. I must have accidentally had an explosive round mixed in. I'm so sorry. Are you okay, Blake? Blake nodded as Naruto said, Actually, Yang, the explosion was my fault. Everyone looked at him with confusion. You all remember how my two dragons exploded, right? They nodded. My wind techniques charge the air with a lot of energy that can be used as a fuel source for fire techniques, causing large explosions when they collide. Apparently, it does the same thing with fire dust. I didn't realize that it could do that until now. Ruby replied, So your attacks can make Yang's attacks more powerful? He nodded, and she pouted. It's not fair having to fight you and Yang at the same time. Yang was looking relieved at this point, happy that it wasn't her lack of organization that had caused a near disaster. Then let's mix up the teams. We're stopping for a few minutes anyway. I'm thinking me and Rubes versus Whiskers and Blakey. That way, I'll have plenty of opportunity to get revenge on you for almost blowing up my sister and my partner. Yang was smiling evilly, and Naruto nodded. Sounds fine to me. He was hoping that Yang would make good on her threat of revenge, so that he could take the brunt of the attacks to give Blake some breathing room since she was the most battered out of all of them. Tell us when you're ready, Blake. After a few minutes, during which Ruby retrieved Crescent Rose, Blake got up and said, I've rested enough. Let's resume. Each mini team walked to opposite ends of the arena. On the way, Naruto asked Blake, So, any ideas for a mini-team name? Blake raised an eyebrow at him. A what? Well, apparently Yang and I are team hot stuff. I figured we'd make a name for each two-man squad. They reached their position and turned around, facing Yang and Ruby. Blake was silent for a moment before saying, I've got nothing. Naruto nodded. Well, we can figure it out later. Go. This last word began the bout, and both teams charged at each other. Naruto drew Firestorm and shifted it into rifle form. Blake saw what he was doing and shifted Gamble Shroud into pistol mode. They simultaneously stopped, and Naruto dropped to a knee. A barrage of dust rounds flew at Yang and Ruby, who stopped their charge and began to block and dodge for a few seconds before returning the barrage with some rounds of their own, forcing Naruto and Blake to begin dodging as well. 
Every shot from Yang's gauntlets was aimed at Naruto, while Ruby split her shots about evenly. All four of them sustained a few minor hits, and one of Ruby's shots hit Naruto in his ankle, bruising it slightly. Naruto decided that he had had enough of this standoff and sheathed Firestorm. Pushing Chakra into his legs, he charged at Ruby, knowing that Yang would probably go after him as well. He drew Kitsu no Akari and swung it, only to have it knocked aside by Crescent Rose. The next 30 seconds were a blur to Naruto as he ducked, darted, and dodged to try and get away from the spinning angel of death that was Ruby Rose. He barely had a chance to launch an attack, and only managed to land a single glancing blow to Ruby's arm, whereas she scored several major strikes on him that would have left bruises or broken bones if he hadn't used his aura to shield him. As he was trying to form a plan, he suddenly felt something hit him in the face and explode, flinging him almost 10 yards away. He landed with a roll and stood up to see Yang standing next to Ruby, her fist still extended from punching him. Blake used her semblance to jump next to Naruto. Sorry. I tried to hold her off, but she got past me. Naruto smiled. That's fine. He spat out some blood. It's time to change our strategy. He then swung Kitsu no Akari in front of them, channeling Chakra through one of the seal arrays within the blade, and a wave of lightning shot out towards Ruby and Yang. He heard another whisper. Good. If they can beat you at short range, make the fight long-ranged. Ruby and Yang were both too shocked at the sudden attack to dodge completely, so they were both shocked. Naruto and Blake rushed forward while they were still recovering. Blake began to fight Ruby, using her semblance to stay away from the blade of Crescent Rose, while Naruto swung Kitsu no Akari at Yang. When Yang blocked it with Ember Celica, she felt electricity course through her again. Jumping back away from the blade, she saw that Naruto's sword was sparking. She remembered him mentioning an ability to create lightning, and groaned as she realized that she would have to dodge his attacks instead of blocking. Naruto charged forward, and Yang fired several shots at him before running out of ammunition. She didn't have a chance to reload as she was forced to quickly dodge several swings from Naruto's sword. She saw an opening as he overextended after an overhead swing and swung a fist into his chest. He rolled backward with the hit to dissipate the force, leaving Kitsu no Akari stuck in the ground near Yang. He came up already weaving seals, and Yang rushed him, trying to interrupt him before he could finish. Her attempt did not succeed, and with a shout of Futon, De Tapa. Great breakthrough, Yang was blown back and fell to the ground. She tried to get up only to feel a slight pressure at her throat. Naruto had rushed after her as she was tumbling, and the tip of Firestorm was pointed at her larynx. Naruto smiled. Game over, Yang. Looking over at Blake and Ruby, Yang saw that Ruby was wrapped up in Blake's ribbons, immobilized. I guess you win, Whiskers. Now let me up already. She smacked his sword aside and stood up. Naruto sheathed Firestorm and walked over to retrieve Kitsu no Akari. Meanwhile, Blake untangled Ruby, who collapsed Crescent Rose and hooked it onto her belt. Once the four had gathered all of their weapons, they all met up in the center of the arena. Naruto said, Okay, next up is Ruby and me versus Yang and Blake. After this bout, We'll take a 15-minute break to discuss small squad tactics and ideas for combo attacks. Yang and Blake looked at each other and smirked before looking back at Naruto and Ruby. Yang said, You two are so going down. Naruto just raised an eyebrow, while Ruby crossed her arms and pouted before saying, No way. We're the best. Yang shook her head. Nobody can beat team. Uh, team Bumblebee. Yeah. Blake looked at her partner and raised an eyebrow. Team Bumblebee? Yang and Blake began to walk to the south end of the arena, and Ruby and Naruto heard Yang saying, Yeah, black and yellow, you know? Chuckling, Naruto began walking to the north side of the arena, closely followed by Ruby, who said, What should our team name be? Naruto thought for a moment before saying, How about Team Petalstorm? Ruby tilted her head. Petalstorm? Naruto nodded to her and smiled. When you use your semblance, it creates little tornadoes of rose petals, and my name means Maelstrom, so I figured it fit. Ruby smiled back at him. I like it. Team Petal Storm. She trailed off as they reached their place. Turning and taking their stances, they saw that Yang and Blake were in position as well. Naruto smirked and shouted, Go! The four teammates charged at each other. Nobody chose to use long-ranged attacks this time around, and so they all met in the middle of the arena. Naruto slashed at Blake with Kitsu no Akari, but was blocked by her katana. Yang fought against Ruby, darting and dodging around Crescent Rose as she looked for an opening. Naruto and Blake fought Katana against Katana for a while. Their swordsmanship was very closely matched, Naruto's speed from slight chakra enhancement allowing him to counter Blake's superior skill with the Katana. 
Deciding to see if he could force an opening, Naruto manifested golden flames on the blade of Kitsu no Akari and shot them out at Blake with a few of his strikes. It paid off, as Blake jumped backward to avoid the fire, giving Naruto room to launch another small wave of lightning. Blake avoided it by using her semblance again, but Naruto's attention was drawn to his right as Yang dodged a strike from Ruby, landing her a little too close to him for her own good. In a fashion similar to a particular green beast, Naruto ran toward Yang before jumping into the air and striking her in the back with a flying kick. Fortunately for everyone, he resisted the temptation to exclaim, dynamic action, knowing that it would incur the wrath of Kurama, and landed safely. Yang, on the other hand, was anything but safe. Knocked forward into Ruby's strike zone and left off balance by the kick, she was quickly struck down and pinned by Ruby's scythe. Turning back toward Blake, Naruto regretted watching for that extra second to see Yang's defeat, as he was met by a sword to the leg. Stumbling sideways, he swung Kitsu no Akari at Blake, but was disarmed when she sidestepped and struck his wrist hard enough to crack one or two of his bones. Ignoring the pain, Naruto jumped back and wove a quick series of hand seals. He finished them just as Blake began to swing Gamble Shroud at him. Fton, Suisin Tatsumaki no Yatsu. Propelling Tornado. Blake was pushed back a few feet by the winds that began to swirl around Naruto. She planted her feet and decided to wait out the effects of the jutsu. Naruto, however, wasn't planning on waiting for long. A few seconds after he began the jutsu, he suddenly leapt towards Blake, his body being shot forward by the wind like a bullet. Blake had barely enough time to react and swung Gamble Shroud wildly at Naruto. Unfortunately for Naruto, Gamble Shroud struck his right wrist for the second time that match. With an awful snap, Naruto's wrist suddenly was consumed by a jolt of pain. However, being the shinobi he was, he ignored this new pain as well. With his left hand, he grabbed Blake by the throat and pinned her to the ground, kneeling on the hand that held Gamble Shroud so that she couldn't use it against him. With Blake and Yang both pinned, the match was declared over, and Naruto went to retrieve his dropped sword. He walked over to Kitsune no Akari, but as he went to pick it up, Another jolt of pain from his wrist caused him to grunt in pain and drop the sword. It did not go unnoticed by his teammates. After he had sheathed Kitsu no Akari with his left hand and returned to his teammates, Ruby asked, Is your wrist alright, Naruto? He looked down at his wrist, which was red and beginning to swell. I'll be okay after we rest. The 15-minute break should be enough. Yang looked at him skeptically. You sure there, Whiskers? I've had some experience with broken wrists, and it looks like you might have one. Can you move your fingers? Naruto defiantly said, Of course I can. He tried to move his fingers, but found them to be stiffer than usual. Grimacing slightly, he forced his hand to curl up into a fist and uncurl. See? Yang gave him an amused look. Yeah, I see that your wrist is broken. Naruto wouldn't concede the point. No, it's not. I'm just fine. He wiggled his fingers to prove a point, but they wiggled jerkily, and his left fist and jaw clenched. It was obvious that it hurt him to move his hand. Ruby, who had been worrying about him ever since he dropped his sword, couldn't watch him cause himself pain anymore. She grabbed his forearm just below his wrist, making sure not to jostle it, and said, Stop! Please stop it, Naruto. Don't hurt yourself more just to prove a stupid point. Please. Naruto looked into Ruby's eyes and saw something he had only rarely seen before. Genuine concern for his well-being. He stopped moving his hand, and allowed his arm to relax in Ruby's grip. Okay, I'll stop. Ruby released his arm, and he lowered it slowly to his side. I'll admit it, my wrist is broken, but honestly, by the time we finish talking tactics, I'll be healed enough to fight. Yang and Blake looked at him skeptically, while Ruby seemed to get mad at him. The red-hooded girl crossed her arms and said, You just agreed to stop hurting yourself to prove a point. There's no way you can heal a broken wrist in 15 minutes. We're taking you to the infirmary this minute to get it looked at. Naruto smiled and chuckled. I heal much faster than most people, Ruby. The break isn't that bad, so it won't take very long to heal. Ruby poked him in the chest to emphasize her point. I don't care how fast you heal. There's no way you can heal from a broken wrist in 15 minutes. Even if you burn up all of your aura healing yourself, it still takes hours to properly fix a broken bone. Naruto smirked. I think a more visible demonstration of my healing prowess is in order. With those words, he drew one of his kanai in his left hand and, before any of his teammates could stop him, made a deep cut on his right forearm. His teammates all cried out in shocked protest, and Ruby knocked the kanai out of his hand with a cry of, What are you doing? Why would you do that? 
As Blake reached for her medical kit, which she kept strapped to her back where it was protected by Gamble Shroud's sheath, Naruto quelled the girl's protests and said, Just watch. You'll be able to see it healing. That got their attention, and they all gazed at the wound. To their surprise, Naruto was right. They could actually see the flesh knitting back together, small amounts of steam rising from the wound. Yang could barely believe her eyes. That's insane. Blake noticed something else and was shocked even more. You're... You're not even using your aura? How can you heal that fast without aura? Naruto was amused by their reactions. I've always healed really fast. To this day, I have never sustained an injury or even a series of injuries that took more than 24 hours for me to heal. Believe me now? Dumbfounded. They all nodded as the cut healed over. Ruby looked at him with awe. You can seriously heal from anything in a day? He nodded. And I don't get scars from my injuries either. Well, except in very extreme circumstances. The three girls wondered what he meant by that, but the far-off, sad expression on his face made them refrain from asking. They all sat down in a circle, and Naruto said, All right, back to business. Now that we've done a round of fights, let's try and think of as many ways to combine our attacks and styles as possible. I'll start with the obvious one. Yang could shoot her dust rounds toward an enemy, and I could hit them with wind techniques to make them do more damage. Any other ideas? Yang bounced up and down, excited about her idea. I've got one. I could flare my semblance, then you could use your wind thingy on me, and it would make a really big explosion. She looked very proud of her idea, while the rest of the team looked skeptical. Blake commented, that seems like a really reckless idea. You're more likely to get hurt than any enemies. Young started to pout, while Ruby looked thoughtful. Maybe if Blake got an enemy caught up in her ribbon like she did with me, and I hooked crescent rows around them, we could pull in opposite directions and slice them in half. Blake also took on a thoughtful expression. For enemies with tougher exteriors, like the Nevermore, that could definitely help to slice through their protections. There would be a limit to the size of the grim we could trap like that, but I like the idea. Yang started fidgeting again. Oh, how about this? Naruto could use his explody ball thing to knock a grim into Ruby's scythe, and then she decapitates it. Ruby nodded and said, that sounds fun. Blake shrugged and commented, it would be effective but any of us could knock a grim to Ruby. Naruto nodded to Blake. True, but I've noticed that Crescent Rose can't always cut through a grim's armor in one strike. If I hit the armor with a Rasengan, it will crack like the Deathstalkers did and give her a much better chance of a one-hit kill. Blake nodded and said, I see your point. Your Rasengan can be the armor-piercing attack of the team. You make openings in grim's armor that the rest of us exploit? Ruby looked toward Blake and said, but we don't want to exhaust him during battles. We can't rely on his Rasengan to punch holes in every grim we encounter. Naruto smiled at Ruby. Good observation, but you don't need to worry about exhausting me just from the Rasengan. I can throw those around for hours before exhausting myself. He turned to the rest of the team. She is right though. Don't count on my Rasengan to punch a hole in every enemy. I might not be at every battle. None of us are guaranteed to be at every battle. They all nodded at his words and Blake said, I think I've got an idea. Naruto hangs back from a grim, while one of us commits to an aerial attack. Ruby and Yang looked at her like she was crazy. They had all been taught that performing an aerial attack left you terribly vulnerable in most situations. Naruto looked thoughtful and waited for her to finish explaining. When the grim is distracted by whoever is in the air, Naruto launches a lightning wave to stun the grim, creating an opening for the aerial attack to be executed. Yang smiled mischievously at the idea of punching a hole in a stunned enemy with Ember Celica, while Ruby said, I like that idea. Naruto looked thoughtful. It would be a good move, but we'd need a call out for it. I wouldn't want to leave one of you vulnerable if I wasn't able to launch a lightning bolt in time. Ruby nodded. That's a good point. Whoever goes for the attack will need to wait for Naruto to signal that he's ready. Naruto spoke up again. I've got one for general use. I think I've mentioned that I can do earth manipulations as well. And if you need me to pin a grim for a few seconds, call it out, and I can encase its feet or paws or claws or whatever in stone. It wouldn't hold for long, but it would be enough to land an attack or two. They continued to propose and refine ideas for the remainder of the break. Though many ideas were thrown out, they had ten promising combos that involved two or three members of the team. Noticing that the fifteen minutes were up and his wrist was more sprained than broken at this point, Naruto got up and stretched. The others got up as well, and Blake said, are you sure your wrist is all right? Smiling, Naruto wiggled his fingers and rotated his wrist, showing that it was only slightly stiff rather than broken. 
I'll be fine. This will be a good opportunity to practice my shirushi with an injured hand. Blake looked curious. That sounds like Japanese, but I don't know that word. What does it mean? Naruto proceeded to run through the 12 standard hand seals at a slower pace than usual, partly due to his wrist, and partly so that his teammates, who were watching closely, could make out what he was doing. Those are shirushi, or hand seals. They mold energy into the proper form and nature for me to accomplish my techniques. Blake and Yang nodded, and Ruby tried to imitate a few of the seals she had seen. She made a perfect Inu seal, which was the easiest, and a passable Taurus seal. Her Hitsuji was a reverse image, and she completely butchered the Ushi seal. Naruto couldn't help but laugh at her antics. Not bad for a first try. She smiled at the praise, and then decided to go into leader mode. Thanks. All right, Team Ruby. Time to continue our spars. This time, let's do Blake and Naruto versus me and Yang. Then Naruto and me versus Yang and Blake. Then Blake and me versus Yang and Naruto. Yang smirked. Trying to delay the onslaught of Team Hot Stuff for as long as possible, I see. Naruto rolled his eyes as he and Blake moved to the other end of the arena. This time, it was Ruby who checked to see if everyone was ready before giving the signal. Go! Team Ruby had continued their sparring for over two and a half hours. It was nearing seven o'clock, and Ruby, Yang, and Blake were barely standing after an incredibly intense fight between Team Petalstorm and Team Bumblebee. The three girls were gasping for air, while Naruto was only sweating slightly and breathing heavily. Yang was glaring at him. How are you not exhausted? Her question was broken up by gasps for air. Naruto smirked. I have unusually high endurance. It was true as well. His huge chakra reserves allowed him to continue this level of sparring for hours on end without succumbing to exhaustion like his three teammates. Yang groaned with exasperation. You used one attack during initiation and almost passed out, and you say you have endurance? Naruto glared back at her. The two techniques I used can use up vastly different amounts of energy depending on how big you try to make them. I did not intend to continue fighting immediately after killing the Nevermore. So I put way more energy into them than I probably should have. Although I did intend to have enough energy to climb the cliffs at the end. Meh. Everyone makes mistakes. Yang grunted and said, Yeah, whatever. As the girls caught their breath, Naruto began thinking about something that had been in the back of his mind ever since he saw Ruby imitating his hand seals. Should I teach them to use jutsu? I'm sure they can learn. They already have lots of aura, and if this training session is any indication, they have enough chi as well. It would help them become much stronger huntresses, and our team would become much more powerful. What do you think, Kurama-sensei? Kurama grunted. I wouldn't trust Ninjin with that kind of power. They are too short-sighted, and will eventually misuse it. Naruto took his sensei's advice with a grain of salt. After all, Kurama hated all mortals, who he called Ninjin, and it was Jutsus wielded by Shinobi that had imprisoned him and his brethren. Kurama didn't exactly have an unbiased opinion. Then again, he brought up some good points. People were very short-sighted. The constant conflict between Faunus and humankind was a testament to that, and with the kind of power that higher-ranked Jutsus and Kenjutsus could provide, there could be some serious consequences involved. Naruto decided to suspend his decision for now. He would wait and perhaps consult Jin Teru, who would be far less biased on the issue, before passing final judgment. With this world as chaotic as it was, Jutsu could bring about either great good or great evil depending on whose hands it was in. Plus, he wasn't sure if anyone from Remnant had properly developed chakra coils. As far as he knew, there was no circulatory system for aura or chi, so having large amounts of both wouldn't necessarily make their chakra coils expand like they should. He emerged from his thoughts as his teammates gathered around him. Ruby looked dead on her feet as she said, I think that's enough practice for today. She sat down on the ground and said, Now back to the dorm. As soon as I've rested, she allowed herself to fall backward so that she was laying on the ground, crescent rose in its storage form at her side. She closed her eyes and groaned. Yang and Blake looked at each other before Blake said, We should wait here with her. Yang nodded, but Naruto shook his head. You two need rest as well, and it's not good for Ruby to be laying on rocky ground like this after a workout. We should go to the dorms now. Ruby groaned and began to complain. I can't get up right now. I can barely even move. Young glared at Naruto and said, We're waiting here with her until she's ready to head back. That's final. Or did you forget how we waited for you in the forest? Naruto shook his head again. I haven't forgotten, and I wasn't saying that we should make her walk. I was thinking we could do this. With those words, he picked up Crescent Rose, which was heavier than he expected it to be, and stuck it to his back with chakra. 
Before Ruby could protest his possession of her beloved weapon, she found herself being carried in his arms bridal style. She was thankful that her hood had flipped up over her head when he had hefted her up, as it now covered her intense blush. Naruto turned to face Young and Blake, who were staring at him a bit, and said, let's get going. He then walked out of the arena, followed closely by his other two teammates. He heard Young mumble something, and he made out the words, carrying around Crescent Rose and Ruby like it's nothing, sideways as much as I do. Meanwhile, Blake was observing the way Crescent Rose was clinging to Naruto's back with no apparent supports. How are you doing that? Naruto turned his head to look at her. Doing what? Blake pointed to the scythe, keeping Crescent Rose secured. Oh, the same way I was able to run up the side of the cliffs and stick to the ceiling. Except instead of making my feet cling to something, I'm making Crescent Rose cling to me. He adjusted his grip on Ruby as she shifted and pushed her hood up so that he could see her face. He noticed that her cheeks were red, but wrote it off as a result of overexertion during training. What you're doing won't hurt Crescent Rose, will it? She had a concerned expression on her face. Naruto shook his head. I've done this before, and with much more fragile materials. Ruby's concerns were alleviated, and she closed her eyes and subconsciously leaned her head into Naruto's shoulder, seeking his gentle warmth. Naruto felt his face redden slightly. She's pretty cute like this. Yang noticed his blush and smiled mischievously. Well, looks like Whiskers is enjoying carrying Ruby around like this. Do I sense a love triangle forming? She still hadn't gotten Ruby to confess about who her crush was, and it didn't occur to her that it could very well be Naruto. After a few more minutes of walking, they made it back to Team Ruby's dorm. Blake opened the door for Naruto, who smiled and thanked her. After everyone was inside and the door was shut, Naruto looked at the girl in his arms and said, Feeling up to standing up now? Ruby briefly considered saying no. She had, in fact, recovered enough energy to function a while ago, but had been enjoying being carried by Naruto too much to say anything. She decided that she had indulged herself enough and nodded. Naruto eased her onto her feet and removed Crescent Rose from his back. Handing it to her, he smiled and said, And here's your sweetheart back. Ruby was surprised that he had referred to Crescent Rose that way without mocking her for it. Thanks. The team then went about getting ready for bed. Ruby set Crescent Rose down on her bed and went to take a much-needed shower, while Yang simply changed into her pajamas, planning on showering in the morning. Blake read a book while she waited for Ruby to be done in the shower, and Naruto put all of his equipment away before pulling out Firestorm and cleaning it and performing maintenance on its firing system, which had been jamming slightly during the spars. Once Ruby was out of the shower and Blake got in, Naruto left the room to go get dinner for everyone. He figured that nobody would want to leave the room again that day, and he came back with two pizzas. Thankfully, the kitchens had allowed him to leave with them without too many questions. Upon entering the room, he barely had enough time to notice that Blake was finished with her shower before he was practically mugged by Yang, who apparently liked pizza almost as much as Ruby liked cookies. Each of them ate half of a pizza, being famished from their training, and Naruto received a great deal of gratitude for bringing food back. He shrugged most of it off. I was getting food anyway. It didn't take much extra effort to bring some back for you three as well. After the pizzas were demolished, Naruto showered and came out to see his three teammates lounging on their beds, studying, doing homework, or just reading. He sat down on his own bed and said, All right, now for the final stage of today's training. This was met with groans and complaints. Yang was the most vocal. What else is there possibly left to do? We sparred. We made up combos. We're exhausted. Naruto chuckled and said, Combos are useless if you don't remember them in the heat of battle. Right now, we're going to list as many of the combos that we made as we can remember and write them down. He already had a pencil and notebook ready. Ruby spoke up in agreement. He's right. Until we can practice them more, we're probably going to forget about them unless we write them down. She hopped down from her bed to grab her own notebook and sat down on Naruto's bed next to him so that it would be easier to talk to everyone. With that final point, they all began recalling as many of the combos that they had created as they could remember. As they recalled combinations that they could do with other members of the team, they all noticed that Naruto had the most combos that he could execute with others. Blake decided to bring this fact into the discussion. It seems like most of our team attacks involve Naruto and his abilities. Ruby glanced at Naruto before saying, She's right. We do seem to be leaning on him a lot. Naruto shook his head. No. You aren't leaning on me. I just happen to have the most flexible and compatible fighting style and abilities. Besides, this was just the first day of team training. I've had a lot of experience in training with a four-man squad, and my ability to work well with others in combat reflects that. 
You guys will catch up eventually. Blake decided that now was the perfect time to sate her curiosity about the source of Naruto's apparently large amount of experience. You do seem to know a great deal about combat and team tactics. Just how long have you been training for? Naruto knew that most hunters and huntresses didn't start even basic training until they were about 12 years old and was about to lie, but he looked at the three people around him who had risked their well-being during initiation to wait with him and decided that he would be truthful. I've trained in combat since I was six years old. Despite knowing that it was coming, he couldn't meet their eyes as their expressions changed to shock and horror. Ruby squeaked out, Six? What kind of person would train a six-year-old to fight? Naruto looked into her eyes and said, I come from a place that was very militaristic in nature. His eyes moved to gaze on each of his teammates before looking down at the notebook in his hand. Blake was unsure if she wanted to find out more, but asked anyway, Where did you come from? Naruto's fist tightened around his pencil. A village called Kanahagakur no Sato. It was not an easy place to live in. Blake absent-mindedly translated out loud. The village hidden in the leaves? Naruto nodded. I'm tired. I'm going to bed now. Ruby hopped off of his bed and watched as he laid down with his back facing them. The three girls could tell that he wasn't really trying to sleep, but they chose not to dig any deeper into his past for the moment. As Yang and Blake put their notebooks away and got into bed themselves, Ruby was just standing still, watching Naruto. She wanted to say something, to somehow help him. It was obvious that his memories of his village were anything but pleasant. After a few more seconds, she nervously said, Naruto? She saw his head shift slightly, as if he was going to turn around, but decided not to, and heard him say, Yes, Ruby? Ruby hesitated for a moment before saying, If you ever want to talk about anything, I just want you to know. I'd be happy to listen. Good night. He didn't move or even acknowledge her statement, and after a few more seconds, she went to climb up to her bed. But as she began to lift herself up, she heard Naruto's voice saying, Thank you, Ruby. She went to bed with a smile on her face and determination in her heart. Whatever had happened to Naruto in the past, she would make sure that he felt at home in Team Ruby. Naruto woke up on Wednesday feeling slightly nauseous. He rose slowly from his bed and looked around the room to see that two of his teammates were still sleeping peacefully. He didn't hear any signs of activity from Fort Rose, so he assumed that Ruby was still sleeping as well. The clock on his desk indicated that it was a quarter to five in the morning. He had sneaked a peek at his teammates' schedules during the last two days, so he knew that none of them had any classes until 10 that day, meaning that they would probably be asleep a while longer. He took a deep breath and put his head in his hands for a moment, sitting back down on his bed as he did so. The conversation he and his teammates had the night before was still weighing on his mind. Internally, he cursed himself. I might have ruined everything. Why did I have to bring up Kanoha? Throughout Naruto's time in Remnant, he hadn't made any close friends. He got to know people a little but he usually kept his distance from the beginning and sometimes would stop interacting with certain people altogether. Ever since Sasuke, he hadn't felt like trusting anyone else enough to become attached to them. It was always when the subject of his past came up that he would grow more distant, and often he would avoid all interactions with a person if they began to ask questions that pertain to Naruto's time in the Elemental Nations. Now they know more about me than anyone else I've known in Remnant. Naruto couldn't help but smirk. His team knew the name of his home village, that he had been trained as a ninja since he was six, and that his first language was Japanese, and they knew more about him than everyone else on Remnant. That definitely indicated something about his social life. The smirk didn't last long, and his expression turned serious as he thought about what he should do next. They know just enough to be curious, but not enough to accept me brushing their questions off. They're smart, and Blake in particular is too perceptive for comfort. They'll figure it out if I try to dodge their questions, and that will just make them more determined. Tricking them won't work either. If I'm lucky, I could fool Ruby, but... That thought reminded him of what Ruby had said to him last night. If you ever want to talk about anything, I just want you to know. I'd be happy to listen. After a moment, he pushed the memory to the back of his mind. I wish it was as simple as just talking to them, but I can't just trust them with information about me. Anyone in this world could be a threat. Anyone could betray me. Naruto got up off of his bed again and changed into black sweatpants and an orange t-shirt. He secured his equipment pouch on his thigh, but decided to leave his swords in the room for the day. As he went through the equipment in his thigh pouch and made sure he had enough of everything he needed, he missed the rustling sounds coming from Fort Rose. As Naruto opened the door to the hallway, he didn't see the pair of silver eyes that peeked out of the curtains of Fort Rose and watched him leave the room. After Naruto shut the door behind him, 
Ruby sighed and looked at the door with a sad expression. Naruto? She whispered. After wandering around Beacon's campus for over an hour and having some breakfast, Naruto stumbled across one of the training grounds that were available to the students at Beacon. It was a fairly large training ground, having an open central area, a wall painted with several targets, and a section that was blocked off by safety glass for spectators to watch and for any extra equipment to be stored. Since it was only 7.30 and Naruto's first class was with his teammates at 10, he decided to get do some training. At the very least, he reasoned, it would help him clear his head and forget about the tension between him and the rest of his team. He decided to do a toned-down version of his usual training routine, as he wanted to have some energy to spare while going through his classes for the day. He began by making a familiar cross-shaped hand seal. Kenjutsu, Taju Kage Bunshin, Forbidden Art, Mass Shadow Replication, 15 clones blurred into existence around him. He had long since improved his control over the Kage Bunshin no Jutsu, to the point where he could produce his shadow clones without the massive burst of smoke and noise, despite the clone's inability to dispel without bursting into clouds of smoke. Five of the clones ran off to secure the perimeter. They would use stealth and kitsune illusions if necessary to remain undetected and would warn Naruto by dispelling if anyone was approaching the training ground. The way things were currently, Naruto wasn't sure that he could handle even more of his skills becoming public knowledge. His teammates already knew too much as it was, and making them even more curious would only exacerbate the problem. Naruto and the ten remaining clones then proceeded to draw one kanai each. All ten of the clones focused their attention on Naruto, and after a moment, all attacked simultaneously. Naruto drew an extra kanai as his clones approached and rolled forward to avoid two clones rushing at him from either side. As he rolled upright, he blocked a stab on each side of him and deflected a third kanai that was thrown at him. Hearing a footstep behind him, Naruto spun around, throwing the kanai in his left hand at a clone that was approaching. Upon completing his turn, he grabbed the arm of a clone that had been trying to attack him from behind, readying his kanai to retaliate. However, before he could dispel the clone, he was forced to block another attack from his right and back up to avoid being completely surrounded by his clones. He threw the kanai in his right hand as he retreated, and it nicked the arm of one of his clones, bringing the number of opponents he had left to nine. As Naruto stared his clones down, his mind was clear. All thoughts of his teammates and the problems he was having were long gone, erased by the thrill of combat. His entire focus was on the moment. His only thoughts were of his training. A smile slowly spread across Naruto's face as his clones rushed him again, and he readied the kanai in his hand. We can't just sit here and do nothing about it, Yang said, throwing her arms into the air in exasperation. After Naruto had left, and Blake and Yang had woken up, Ruby had called another team meeting. At least, a partial team meeting. The three girls of Team Ruby had discussed Naruto's behavior the previous night, as well as his early morning departure. All of them agreed that something was going on with Naruto, and that it was affecting him negatively. So, they had made plans to catch him after their first class and talk to him to make sure that he was alright. At the very least, they wanted to convey to him beyond any doubt that the three of them were there for him if he needed it. Unfortunately for them and their plan, Naruto had shown up to class barely seconds before the professor had started the lecture. He had sat too far from the rest of his team for them to talk to him or contact him in any way that would remain inconspicuous. As soon as class ended, Naruto rushed out of the door and had disappeared into the crowd before they could tell him to wait up for them. All similar attempts to start a discussion with him, or even to remain in the same room as him, failed spectacularly. When they could even find him, he would vanish without a trace before any of them could even get close to him. It was frustrating for Ruby and Blake and infuriating for Yang who was not known for having great patience. This led them to gather back in the dorm room and try to formulate a new plan. It was a quarter to four in the afternoon, and all of their classes were over for the day. The discussion had eventually turned into a debate about the best way to handle the situation. Blake suggested that they wait and let Naruto come to them. Young wanted to corner him and knock some sense into him, and Ruby was uncertain about what they should do. Blake crossed her arms and said, running after him and forcing him into a corner is not going to get the results we want. If anything, he'll just avoid us even more. If we give him some space, then eventually he will talk to us. He has to. We all live in the same room after all. Yang snorted. He's not going to come to us and start talking about his feelings, Blake. He's a guy. A stubborn, macho, overconfident guy. He can probably just keep avoiding us forever if he wants to. Exactly, Blake retorted. Naruto has managed to avoid all three of us for the entire day, and we even had a class together. He saw us and completely disappeared. Chasing after him won't help if he can just evade us. 
All it will do is make him less likely to want to confide in us. Ruby sighed as her sister and Blake argued back and forth about the issue. Seeing Naruto avoid her with such determination all day had made her feel worse and worse each time she tried to get close enough to talk to him. She just wished that things could go back to the way they had been during the practice session. While they had been sparring together, it had felt like the four of them were so close. That thought gave Ruby an idea, and she jumped up from the chair she had been sitting in. Yang, Blake, I know what we can do. Her two teammates looked at her with curious expressions, and she began to explain. Blake is right that trying to run him down won't work. Blake smirked triumphantly at those words. But sitting back and waiting around is out of the question. Now it was Yang's turn to look smug. So, the solution is to make him come to us, Ruby said with a smile. All we need to do is schedule another team practice session. Naruto is really committed to the team. And he keeps saying that it's up to me to make decisions, and up to him to follow those decisions. If I say that there's going to be another team practice today, he'll show up for sure. Yang and Blake both smiled at this. Good idea, little sis, Yang commented. Blake nodded in agreement. He's unlikely to feel like we're trying to corner him if we have a legitimate reason to be around him. He did show up to our shared class after all. Plus, maybe some good bouts will make him more willing to talk to us. Ruby pulled out her scroll. All right, it's settled then. I'll send out a message to the entire team saying that we're having another practice session at 5 o'clock at the same training area as last time. Once we're there, we won't try to have our talk with him until after we do a few fights, all right? After her teammates agreed, Ruby began to type out a message on her scroll. Attention, Team Ruby. Since we only have a few days before our ranks are decided, I'm calling another team practice session for today. Meet at the same training ground that we used yesterday at 5 o'clock, and don't be late. Ruby Rose, team leader and best huntress ever. She sent the message out to the whole team, and Yang and Blake opened up their scrolls just to get them to stop sending a message alert. Yang decided to read the message just for the hell of it and chuckled at Ruby's sign-off. Was the last bit really necessary? She asked her sister. Ruby crossed her arms and said, Yes. Yang looked at her with amusement, and Ruby shifted under Yang's scrutiny. Well, not really. But it's still true. Naruto was sitting in a tree, devoting more time and thought towards the situation with his teammates when his scroll played the ringtone that signified a new message. He pulled the device out of his pocket and opened the message. After he read it, he slumped and sighed in frustration. There was no proof that Ruby was doing this just to force him to interact with the rest of his team, and it might have even been a little conceited to think that was a possibility, but at that moment, it sure felt like it to Naruto. Despite the apparent ease with which he had done it, avoiding the rest of Team Ruby wasn't effortless. He had even been forced to use a Kitsune illusion once in order to avoid detection by his overzealous teammates. As good as their intentions might have been, what Naruto needed, in his opinion, was some time alone. The blonde huntsman ran a hand through his hair as he thought about how to deal with this new development. He couldn't just skip the practice session. The message was now registered as having been opened, preventing him from feigning ignorance, and ignoring an order from his team leader could get him reported for insubordination. Besides, he just didn't have the heart to defy Ruby, especially when she was being a good leader. Naruto's only option would be to put on a mask, and it wouldn't be the physical kind. He had plenty of experience with hiding his true self behind a mask in the past. In Kanoha, he had played the part of the happy fool, while in reality, he was anything but. He may not have been the sharpest kanai in the pouch, but he wasn't quite as stupid as his test scores had indicated. And he had rarely been happy in his day-to-day -day life in Kanoha. He had faked it to hide the pain and loneliness that the hatred of the villagers had made him feel. This time, Naruto doubted that the happy idiot persona would work. His teammates knew that he was intelligent, and they also knew that there was something troubling him. Wearing that mask would be broadcasting to them that he was trying to hide something from them. This was an issue, since that was the only false persona that Naruto had ever projected. He couldn't think of anything else to try. For a moment, he considered asking Kurama for advice, but then dismissed the idea, considering the fact that the old Kitsune would probably just scoff at him and say that he should just make any human he encountered submit to his will, rather than trying to avoid their questions. While imagining his sensei's reaction, an idea struck Naruto. It wasn't something he had ever considered trying before, and he would probably have to tone it down somewhat for it to have the desired effect, but it just might work. As Naruto leapt out of the tree and began walking to retrieve his swords and proper attire, he asked himself one question to begin making his mask. What would Sensei do? It was 4.58, and there was no sign of Naruto at the training ground. Ruby, Yang, and Blake were waiting and watching for him, but Ruby was becoming depressed. 
feeling like her plan had failed. I thought for sure that he would come, Ruby said. Blake checked the time again and watched as it went from 4.58 to 4.59. He could still show up, Blake said. With less than a minute left, not likely, Young commented. He could just be running late, I suppose. Ruby sighed. He's been done with classes for hours. If he doesn't show up on time, it's on purpose. And that's if he comes at all. Yang sat down on the ground and rested her chin on her fist. Well then, now what do we do? If he doesn't come, Ruby could technically report him for insubordination, Blake said. He would be called in for a meeting with Ruby and a professor and would have to talk to her. Ruby shook her head. I don't want to do that to him. If it gets to be a major problem maybe, but I don't want him to get in trouble over something so small. Besides, if trying to corner him would make him upset with us, I can't imagine how he would feel about being reported for insubordination. Blake was about to reply, but there was a sudden noise behind the three girls, and they all spun around to a sight that made them gasp. It was Naruto, but there was something decidedly different about him. Firstly, he wasn't in casual clothes like the last time they had practiced. He had put on his battle cloak and mask, and he was wearing the flame-painted arm guards and shin guards that he had worn in the forest. He was pulling on his armor-plated gloves as he walked toward his team. The biggest thing that made him seem different was the way he carried himself. During the first practice session, he had been relaxed the entire time, even when he had broken his wrist. Now, however, he walked as if he was prepared to fight to the death. This wasn't Naruto, their teammate. This was Naruto, the huntsman. The deadly warrior who could call upon nature's wrath on his own power like an angry deity. He was distant, unapproachable, and just a little bit frightening. Naruto finished pulling on his gloves and stopped in front of his three teammates. As if on cue, Ruby's scroll beeped, the alarm she had set for five o'clock going off, showing that Naruto was perfectly on time. They all stood there silently for a few seconds before Naruto said to Ruby, what are your orders? Ruby blinked and shook herself out of her shock. Huh, your orders, what are they? Naruto said. Ruby nearly shivered at how cold his words were. The warm, caring teammate she was used to was gone. Now he reminded her of how he was when he was berating her in the forest during initiation. Um, I was thinking that since we could start out doing what we did last time, and then see where things go from there, Ruby said nervously. Naruto simply nodded and said, very well. All four of them remained silent for a few seconds until Ruby decided that the best course of action was to start the bout. Right. Well, let's start with Team Petalstorm versus Team Bumblebee. The rest of her team nodded and the two pairs moved to opposite ends of the arena. Naruto remained completely silent as he walked. Ruby couldn't even hear his footsteps, and it was a little unnerving. As Ruby called out for the spar to start, she began to question whether this had been a good idea after all. Ruby flopped down onto Blake's bed, not having the energy to climb up to Fort Rose at the moment. Blake looked like she was about to protest, but then shrugged and flopped down next to her team leader. Young quickly followed suit, saying, well, that was a massive waste of time. Blake and Ruby wanted to argue the point, but they couldn't really dispute it. We did get some practice in, Blake said. That's something. Iguess, Yang admitted. We didn't do what we wanted to, though. Throughout every spar, Naruto had hardly said anything. He had responded only to direct orders from Ruby and questions that directly related to what they were doing at the time. When they tried to coax him into talking to them, he had simply stared at them and declined to answer until they backed down. All three of them had felt nervousness and a subtle fear whenever he had stared at them like that, and they couldn't explain why. Naruto also made them pay for their inquiries out on the battlefield. He began using fewer wind attacks as he had been doing in the previous spars, and began using more lightning and fire attacks. He didn't seem to care if whoever his partner was at the time was subject to collateral damage either. At one point, it had nearly turned into a three-on-one fight, when Yang had lost her temper and turned on Naruto while she was his partner. Thankfully. Ruby had stepped in and stopped the spar before things went too far, but it still didn't make them feel any better about their progress with the issue. As soon as Ruby had announced that the official team practice was over, Naruto had disappeared. He literally vanished in a swirl of wind and leaves, leaving his teammates gaping at the spot where he had been standing. Blake sighed. I can't really argue with that. We did find out that he can just disappear into thin air though, which will save us some effort trying to chase him down. How did he even do that? Mm. Ruby said. I think he might be able to become invisible. Blake and Young both turned to stare at Ruby incredulously. Seriously? Young said. And you didn't think to mention this while we were off on a wild goose chase? Ruby looked at her sister sheepishly. Sorry. 
I kind of forgot about it until he disappeared today. What makes you think he can become invisible anyway? Blake asked. Well, remember how I fought against Roman Torchwick and his thugs that one time? Blake nodded, having been told about the time Naruto had saved Ruby's life. Afterwards, Professor Goodwitch took me down to the police station and basically scolded me for getting involved in something that was a problem for the officials. She left to try to track down Naruto, and Professor Oshpin came in. He asked me where I learned to use Crescent Rose, and showed me some of the surveillance footage from the battle. Ruby got up from Blake's bed and picked up her scroll. While the footage was playing, I saw something weird happen, and asked Oshpin to go back a few seconds in the video. I had been wondering where that knife came from, you see, and I was watching to see who had thrown it. In the video, Naruto just appeared out of nowhere for a second, threw the knife, and disappeared again. Then, later, he appeared out of nowhere a second time. I figured that he must be able to become invisible in order to do that. She opened her scroll and began to look through her files, just to give her something to do. Young also got up from Blake's bed, making her very happy as she stretched out and took advantage of all the space she now had. So we've been chasing a guy who can become invisible? Ruby nodded, and Young groaned in exasperation. Screw my life. The three girls got ready for bed, having already eaten dinner. As Ruby climbed up into Fort Rose, she looked down at Naruto's bed, and then at the door and sighed. It was past 10 o'clock, and Naruto still hadn't come back to the dorm room. She was beginning to get worried about him, and decided to stay awake until he returned. As she lay in her bed, looking out of a gap in the curtains, she was unaware that she would be waiting for nothing. It was nearly three hours before she succumbed to the call of slumber, and Naruto had still not returned. After practice, Naruto had returned to the tree that he had been sitting in earlier that day. It was in a fairly out-of-the-way place, so nobody had passed by it in several hours. Naruto sighed as he thought over his strategy for avoiding questions during practice. Between his full battle outfit and the small amounts of KI he had saturated the area with, he had managed to create an excellent air of intimidation. Acting like a haughty demon lord wasn't too difficult, since he had one living in him to copy off of. The end result had kept his team nervous and reluctant enough that he was able to avoid answering any questions he didn't want to. His use of the Shunshin no Jutsu, Body Flicker Jutsu, after practice was over was probably ill-advised, but he was simply too anxious to leave to be able to just walk out of the training ground. The Shunshin no Jutsu allowed him to move even faster than Ruby could, but he had to focus on his destination for several seconds, and the chakra control required to perform the technique was almost beyond his abilities. There was no way he was ever going to be able to use that jutsu in active combat, except perhaps as an escape tactic. Despite the resounding success of his tactics, he couldn't help but feel sad. He didn't want his team to be afraid of him or to be distant from them. The alternative of them finding out what he was and where he came from was just something that was worse in his mind. Naruto needed to think things through before he did anything more about the situation. He wasn't sure what the best option for him was. There was a small part of him that wanted to confide in his teammates. That part of him was desperate to have someone precious to him again, but another part of him remembered his last betrayal too freshly and wouldn't let him put himself at risk for that again. As Naruto watched the broken moon rise, he slowly drifted off to sleep, his mind still in turmoil, wondering what he could do to make his situation turn out for the best. On Thursday, when the girls of Team Ruby woke up at 7 to get ready for class, they quickly noticed that Naruto was missing. His bed was completely undisturbed, and it looked like it hadn't been slept in the previous night. When Ruby told Blake and Young about how she had tried to stay awake to talk to Naruto when he came back, they all came to the same conclusion. Naruto hadn't returned to the dorm room at all between the time the team training had ended and the time that the three girls had woken up. After some discussion, the three of them agreed that their attempts to simply be there for Naruto were definitely not working and had probably led to him spending the night outside of the dorm room. Well, Ruby said, I guess he's too worked up right now to even want to talk to us or spend time in the same room as us. Hopefully he'll chill out and come and talk to us on his own soon. Blake nodded, but Young huffed and said, I still think we should just knock some sense into him. She made a few punching motions. If you can catch him to do that, go right ahead, Blake said dryly. Young opened her mouth to respond, but then thought better of it and just grunted in acknowledgement of Blake's statement. A few minutes later, Blake, Ruby, and Yang were on their way to the cafeteria to have breakfast. On the way there, they ran into Team JNPR, who were also on their way to have breakfast, and the seven students ended up going as a group. So, how's the team doing, John? Ruby asked. Jeune Schrugged. Pretty well. With classes starting, we've mostly been getting used to things here. How about your team? Ruby hesitated for a moment. We're doing all right. 
We've had a few training sessions together to improve our teamwork, and those went well, mostly. John raised an eyebrow. Is there something wrong? I noticed that Naruto's not with you guys. Is he hurt or something? Ruby shook her head. No, it's nothing like that. It's just... Naruto's been a bit distant recently. He didn't even come back to the dorm room to sleep last night. Wow, where is he then? We don't know, Ruby admitted after a moment. We haven't really been able to talk to him since Tuesday. The last time we saw him was when training ended. What time was that? John asked. Ruby shrugged. About 6.30. We didn't train for nearly as long as last time. Ooh, I've seen him since then. Both John and Ruby jumped a bit as Nora sprung up between them. Ruby's shock quickly wore off as she focused her attention on the hyperactive girl. Really? Where did you see him? Nora smiled and said, It was about eight last night, I think. I was coming back from the edge of the Emerald Forest, and he was headed in the opposite direction. Ruby's eyes widened. He was headed toward the Emerald Forest? Probably, Nora said with a nod. I don't think there's much else in that area. Nora, Rin suddenly said. Why exactly were you at the edge of the Emerald Forest in the first place? Nora looked at Ron like the answer should be obvious. We still don't know what a sloth sounds like, Ron. I was trying to find one and listen to it. Ron and John face-bombed, while Team Ruby looked at Nora incredulously. Pira, however, looked thoughtful. You don't think he actually went into the forest, do you? This made the three present members of Team Ruby fix their gazes on Pira. I hope not, Blake said. Why would he? Well, apparently, it's E. Tradition that students spend an entire night in the Emerald Forest before they graduate, Pira said. Usually, students will do this as a team, and almost always wait until their third year at least, since they can handle themselves by then. She paused for a moment. But, I might not be surprised if Naruto felt confident enough to try it right away. A nervousness began to creep up on Ruby as she imagined Naruto going into the forest alone. Where did you hear about that? Ruby asked. Pira shrugged. It's actually a pretty common practice at higher academies like Beacon, at least. Ones that have a grim-infested forest at hand. Some places discourage it, some don't. From what I've heard from some of the older students, Beacon's official stance on it is that it's against the rules. But the unofficial rule is that if you don't get caught and nobody gets badly hurt, they'll turn a blind eye. There was silence for a moment, before Young spoke up. I wouldn't put it past Whiskers to do something stupid like that. He's a real knucklehead sometimes. Especially over the last few days. It was easy to see that Yang and her two teammates were concerned for Naruto now that there was a possibility that he had ventured into the forest. Team JNPR wasn't sure how to respond to Yang's words, and John decided to try and reassure Team Ruby. Even if he did go into the forest, it's not like anything in there could hurt him, right? Ruby shook her head. It's unlikely, but there are some grim that no one can handle alone. Especially if a horde forms. There was silence after that, until Nora went up to an older student, and asked if he knew what a sloth sounded like. Normally, Team Ruby would have found this very amusing, but at the moment, it didn't seem to cheer them up at all. After a quiet breakfast, Team JNPR went directly to class, and the girls of Team Ruby returned to their dorm room to get everything they needed for class. When Ruby got into the room, she sat on the chair in front of her desk and leaned back on it with a sigh. Young noticed that she looked worried, and it wasn't hard to guess what it was she was worried about. Nervous about whiskers? Young asked her. A little, Ruby admitted. I just want to know that he's safe. During initiation, he still needed our help to take down the Nevermore. If he comes across another one, I'm not sure if he can handle something like that on his own. Yang chewed on her lip for a moment, thinking. Look, we're not even sure he went into the forest at all, Yang said. If you're so worried about him, just call him. Even if he just answers and hangs up on you or something, you'll know that he's alright. Ruby smiled at Yang and grabbed her scroll. Good idea. Blake and Young waited as Ruby put the scroll up to her ear. Ruby listened as her scroll rang once, twice, three times. Ruby heard a total of seven rings before the call stopped, and a computerized voice said that her call was being directed to a voicemail box. She lowered the scroll, hit the end call button, and turned to her teammates. He didn't answer. It went to voicemail. Well, leave him a message then, Young said. Ruby smiled sheepishly. All right. Saudi. Yang rolled her eyes at her sister's lack of social sense. Ruby quickly called Naruto's scroll again, this time waiting until she heard the customary beep before saying, Hey, Naruto, it's Ruby. You didn't come back to the dorm room last night. Well, you knew that already, since it was you who didn't come back in the first place, so I guess there's no point in telling you that. Anyway, we couldn't find you anywhere, 
and nobody has seen you or knows where you are, which is really weird. We, oh, by the way, by a we, I mean me, Yong and Blake, cause they're here too, and they help look for you and stuff. So, we heard that some students like to wander out into the Emerald Forest sometimes to blow off steam, and it seemed like something you might do when you were angry, and you seemed like you were a little angry yesterday since you were zapping all of us way more than before. Someone mentioned that you were heading toward the Emerald Forest last night, and since we haven't seen you since practice, we were kind of getting worried about you. So, I called to make sure you were okay and not hurt or anything, so please call me back or at least message me or something. Thanks, bye. Yang and Blake had to take a moment to marvel at the speed at which Ruby had said all of that. There, Yang said once, she had processed what her sister had said. Now he'll just call you back once he gets the chance. Ruby nodded, and the anxiety she had been feeling soon faded away. The likelihood of Naruto actually going into the Emerald Forest and staying there for the entire night was relatively small. Leaving the message gave her the feeling that she was actively doing something about the situation, so she was able to focus on getting ready for class. Blake, Yang, and Ruby had been sitting in the classroom for a while, and class was only a few minutes away from starting. However, despite his habit of usually arriving early to class, Naruto had not yet entered the room. As his three teammates sat there, watching the time tick closer and closer to the time that class would start, all three of them felt their anxiety for their teammate rise slowly. Naruto would never skip class. He was too dedicated to break the rules like that. The door to the room opened, and the three attending members of Team Ruby turned to see if their final teammate had decided to show up. Unfortunately for them, it was some student they had never seen before. They turned back to the front of the room as the students sat near the back of the room off to their left. When class started, and Naruto had still not arrived, Ruby felt slightly nauseous. No matter what the reason, if Naruto was missing class, something was wrong. Yang and Blake were also worried, but they were able to put their nervousness on behalf of their teammate on hold while they were in class. Ruby, on the other hand, was not good at focusing for long periods of time to begin with. For the first 10 minutes, she was able to pay at least a little attention to what the professor was saying, but that soon became impossible. Ruby began to subtly check her scroll to see if Naruto had made any sort of response at all, whether it be a message or a call that she had somehow missed. There continued to be no response. Soon, Ruby had the idea to send him a text message, thinking that maybe he would respond to that. She quickly and discreetly typed the message into her scroll. Naruto, please check the voicemail I left you. It's important. That was all that she felt safe typing while in class. She didn't want to get caught by the professor after all. She didn't notice the student that she hadn't recognized pulling out his scroll and glancing at its screen. Nor did she notice him glance in her direction before sighing in exasperation and putting his scroll back away. When Naruto had woken up that morning, he was still in the tree he had fallen asleep in, which was a good thing, since the alternative was him falling out of the tree. That would have resulted in him being very irritated. After stretching and hopping down from his tree, Naruto decided to run to the edge of the Emerald Forest and back to loosen up his muscles. It was a fairly short run, as the tree Naruto had chosen to sleep in was close to the deadly woods, though still on beacon grounds. About halfway to the edge of the forest, he heard his scroll ringing. Not wanting to interrupt his run, he decided to ignore it until later. When he returned to his starting point, he pulled out his scroll to see who had called him. He took a deep breath and let out a long sigh when he saw that it was Ruby who had called him. Apparently, his demon lord persona was effective only for in-person interactions. Naruto paused for a moment to think about whether or not he should check his voicemail box. During his contemplations both while sitting in the tree and while running, Naruto had come to realize that it was very unlikely that any of his teammates would betray him in the manner that he had experienced in the Elemental Nations. However, they were almost certain to react negatively to the fact that he was from another world, and the fact that he was a Hanyu. Their job was to fight and kill demons. Being half-demon wasn't going to earn him any goodwill. After a few seconds, Naruto decided to leave his voicemail box unopened for the moment. He didn't want to have to deal with his teammates until he had taken enough time to think through what he was going to do and how he was going to proceed. Checking the time on his scroll, Naruto remembered that he had class in less than an hour and groaned in frustration. It was one of the classes that he had with the rest of his team, and he wasn't sure he was up for another appearance of his demon lord mask. Then, Naruto had an idea that caused the ghost of a smile to grace his face. He'd already used the Shunshin no Jutsu, body flicker Jutsu, to avoid his teammates. Why not add the cage hinge, shadow transformation, to that list? When Naruto walked into the classroom that already held his three teammates, he did not look like himself. He had hinged to give himself short, black hair and brown eyes. He was also a few inches shorter than his actual body was. 
He sat down near the back and on the left side of the classroom, out of the direct line of sight of his teammates, and began to take notes as soon as the professor began the lecture. As focused as he was on his notes, Naruto was surprised when his scroll went off quietly, signaling that someone had sent him a message. Have to silence the scroll, and have to see who would be sending him a message in the first place. Naruto discreetly opened the scroll and then the message. After reading it, and seeing that it was from Ruby, he sighed. Apparently, Ruby wanted to make contact with him enough to become distracted from class. Naruto turned off his scroll, deciding to ignore the situation at least until class was finished. Throughout the course of class, Ruby had ended up sending Naruto a total of five messages, each one sounding more worried than the last. When the class was finally dismissed, Ruby, Yong, and Blake reconvened just outside of the classroom, where Ruby was trying her hardest to not completely freak out from how worried she was. With each message she had sent only to have no reply, she became more and more certain that Naruto had indeed gone out into the forest and was now not in any condition to reply to her messages. Naruto himself had headed straight for the library as soon as class had ended, and therefore had missed the state that Ruby was in. With his scroll still off, he hadn't realized that she had messaged him several more times. Calm down, Ruby, Yang said. What makes you so sure that Naruto's in trouble? Ruby took a deep breath, doing her best to be level-headed in this situation, and replied, I left him a voicemail. I sent him five messages. He's not replying. Something's wrong, Yang. Yang didn't have anything to argue against that, and she and Blake became worried as well. Okay, Blake said. Naruto might be in trouble. What's our plan? We go looking for him, Ruby said. Let's go get our stuff and get out there to find him. She took off for the dorm room, where all of their stuff currently was, before Yang and Blake could reply. In her anxiety, Ruby even used her semblance, leaving her two teammates in the dust. Yang and Blake hurried after her as quickly as they could, both to start looking for Naruto faster, and to make sure that Ruby didn't go off looking on her own in her panic. Naruto reached the library, which was near the dorms, within a few minutes. He quickly located the books he needed and checked them out, as he left with the two books under his arm. He remembered how he had turned his scroll off and pulled it out with his free hand to turn it back on. Once it was fully functional again, he noticed the several messages that Ruby had sent him, along with another message from Blake and two from Yang. He was surprised at their insistence, especially so soon after the intimidating training session, and began to open up the messages to read what they said as he began walking back to the dorm. Naruto, could you please message me back and at least let me know that you're not out in the Emerald Forest trying to kill Grimm? Hey, even if you're in the Emerald Forest, a message to let me know you're okay would be nice. Seriously, Nora said she saw you headed toward the Emerald Forest last night, and if you're trying to go through that dumb tradition, I don't care. I'm completely fine with it. Just let me know so I can stop worrying. Please, Naruto. I just want to know that you're all right. Call me. Message me. Whatever. As long as you tell me you're all right. Those four were from Ruby, and Naruto raised an eyebrow when she mentioned the tradition. He would have to look into this tradition later. Naruto, as your teammates, we would like a report on your current condition. If we can't make contact with you, Ruby's going to tear through the Emerald Forest looking for you. Naruto raised an eyebrow at Blake's message. What was all this about him being lost in the Emerald Forest? Whiskers, you better message us back, or I'm kicking your ass when I find you. If this is some kind of sick joke, I will kick you in the balls. They were overreacting in Naruto's opinion, and he decided that he would take his books back to the dorm room before messaging them back since he didn't feel like trying to type coherently with one hand. By the time Yang and Blake had reached the dorm room, Ruby was nearly twitching in agitation and impatience, and there were more than a few rose petals scattered across the room. She was already prepared to go after Naruto, and the second she saw her teammates, she ran up to them. I'm going to go on ahead. You two follow once you're ready. Hold on, Ruby, Young said. We can't just go charging into this without any planning. Ruby opened her mouth to protest, but Blake cut her off. She's right. First, let Young and I send him messages as well. As much as I hate to say it, he may just be ignoring you. This suggestion definitely didn't make Ruby feel any better. Second, if we're going to have a search party out after him, we should have an official one. Contact the headmaster, have multiple teams, do a proper search pattern. If you end up getting lost in the forest, that won't do anyone any good. As much as she didn't want to, Ruby couldn't deny that Blake was right. All right, message him. If he doesn't reply, I'll go to Ashbin. Blake and Yang quickly typed out and sent their messages. A few minutes later, Yang sent a second message, and Blake and Ruby looked at her curiously. I threatened to kick him in the nuts if this was all some stupid joke, she explained. 
Ruby didn't react to this at all, while Blake nodded in approval. Whether it was approval of the threatening message or approval in the idea itself, Yang was unsure. Ten minutes passed with no replies whatsoever, and Ruby decided that enough was enough. That's it. I'm going to get Ashbin. Then I'm going in there myself to look for him. Where is Ashbin's office, Innie? Her words were cut off as the door to the dorm room opened. The three girls fell silent and froze as the person who opened the door stepped through. It was Naruto. He still had his battle clothes and equipment on, and there were a few leaves in his hair. One of them fell and glided down to the floor of the dorm room as the blonde ninja stepped into the dorm room and shut the door behind him. He looked at his teammates, and for a moment, all of them stood still. Then Yang's hands curled up into fists, and her eyes turned red. Naruto shifted slightly and set his books down on the bookshelves next to the door. Well, this is going to be interesting. Yang moved forward and cocked her fist backward. Naruto easily caught the punch she threw and held onto her fist so that she couldn't try it again. He felt the air around her heat up as she said, What the hell is wrong with you? Naruto raised an eyebrow. Nothing that I was aware of. Were you thinking of something specific, or just asking in general? Yang growled in anger, and Naruto felt the heat increase. Are you just ignoring us completely now? We sent you like, 20 messages? Naruto pushed back against Yang's fist, and tightened his grip. I don't have to answer messages if I don't want to. And try 8, not 20. You're unbelievable. You had enough time to count them, but you couldn't bother to reply to let us know you were okay? Yang yanked her fist out of Naruto's grip and looked like she was going to try and punch him again, before pushing past him and walking to the door. Whatever. You're not worth the effort it would take to punch your teeth in for being such an ass. The angry blonde left the room, slamming the door behind her. Naruto, who had turned to watch Yang leave, turned back only to be taken completely by surprise. Ruby walked up to him, and slapped him in the face. Naruto was shocked enough by this that he didn't even move to catch Ruby's hand. His head was jerked to the side by the force of the slap, and he turned back to Ruby to stare at her, dumbfounded. Ruby was shaking, her hand still half extended from the slap. Her hood was still up on her head, so her eyes were obscured, and Naruto couldn't gauge her expression. Ruby, what? He barely began to speak before Ruby pushed him out of the way and ran out of the room, slamming the door behind her. Naruto turned back to look at Blake, a little more alert this time. Thankfully, his fellow black-clad student simply stood there, glaring at him. Well, that was unusual. In that moment, Blake became so angry at Naruto that she began to produce honest-to-God killing intent. It was very weak killing intent, but it was K.I. all the same. Naruto stiffened, not from the effects of Blake's K.I., but from sheer shock that she was able to produce any at all. I don't care, Blake said slowly, her voice venomous why you've been avoiding us or why you don't want us asking questions about your past. This had all started after they had asked about his training and he mentioned Kanoha, and it hadn't taken Blake long to figure out what had started it. How much effort would it have taken you to send us one message? One. Damn. Message. That's all it would have taken to let us know that you weren't in mortal danger. Naruto was now beginning to feel a little guilty. Perhaps he had dismissed their messages too casually. I thought we made it clear, Blake continued, that we cared about you that you were our teammate, and that we were willing to put ourselves in danger for you. I thought, I hope that you would feel the same for us. I guess I was wrong, since apparently it's too much to ask for you to even write us a message to put our minds at ease. Blake walked past Naruto, who didn't move as she opened the door. She paused before leaving to say, and if it meant that much to you, you could have asked us to not ask questions about your past instead of treating us like lepers. She shut the door behind her, and Naruto winced at the sound. He stood still for a few seconds before slowly walking over to his bed and sitting down. They were that worried about me? He thought back to the training session yesterday, when he had begun to go a little overboard with his jutsus. Even after all of that, they were worried, and I've been treating them like, like how Sasuke treated me. Naruto put his head in his hands as he realized what he had done. Forget bringing up Kanoha. Now, I really might have ruined everything. Ruby sat next to Yang underneath a large tree. There were tears in her eyes that she refused to let fall, and Yang had an arm around her younger sister. After everything we've done together, initiation, the training, him saving me, do we really mean that little to him? Yang Sigit. I don't know, Ruby. I just don't know. She looked up as she heard footsteps and saw Blake moving in their direction. Blake walked up to the two sisters, paused for a moment, and then sat down on Yang's other side. The blonde put an arm around her partner as well. Blake looked like she was going to protest for a moment before just sighing and accepting it, 
knowing that this was for Yang's comfort as much as it was for hers. I wish things could go back to how they were before. Ruby whispered. Me too, Ruby. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.